Hey everybody, Bill Sky the Computer Guy, and I just wanted to go over a very, very, what I think is a pretty simple topic, but one that a lot of people don't really understand. And before we get into C or C++ or assembly language or Java, let's talk about what programming really is. We're going to talk a little bit about what a computer is, and then we're going to talk about what programming is. So let's get started with that. So what is a computer really? A computer is really a collection of on and off switches. It's, it's really nothing more than that. It uses the binary number system, which uses only two digits, zero and one. Zero means off, one means on. That's really all it is, and it's implemented using transistors, a very, very small little electronic device that's almost like a door, where it opens up the electricity, lets it go through, or closes the door, and doesn't let the electricity go through. And opening the door would be a one, closing the door would be a zero. Programming is the process of turning on and off all of those computer switches, well, not all of them at the same time, but turning them on or off in such a way to accomplish something. And it's all mathematical based on discrete mathematics and logic, and it's really built in at the chip level, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. And what are programming languages? They are an easier way to program these on and off switches instead of just manipulating them, well, not necessarily by hand, but by using zeros and ones. We don't, we don't like to do that. Human beings don't think that way. So a programming language takes that complexity of zero and ones and brings it closer to our quote unquote language, depending upon if you're, you know, if you speak English or Cantonese or Spanish or Italian or French, whatever it is, the programming language can be set up in such a way where it lets you more naturally tell the computer what to do. So going over a little bit about what the computer is, the brain of any computer is the central processing unit or what they call the CPU. Computers also contain management circuitry, which sometimes they call control or supporting chips to help the CPU manage everything it needs to do. It needs to manage the data coming into it. It needs to manage output devices, input devices, which we'll show examples of in just a moment. It needs to worry about all that. It also needs to worry about one of its best friends, which is called primary storage, or memory or RAM, random access memory. And that is really the short-term memory, which can lose all of its contents when the power is turned off. So you've got memory chips, and there's a picture here showing those memory chips. And when the power is turned off, all of that information in those chips is lost. You need a thing called secondary storage or long-term storage to hold that information after the computer has been turned off. An example of those types of devices is a hard disk drive, been around for years, still unbelievably reliable. USB thumb drives, you know, everybody has seen those, right? You stick in your USB and you can write to them. Interesting thing about USB thumb drives, they do have a limited life. You can only write to them a certain number of times. So you want to make sure you back up all of your data on a USB thumb drive from time to time. Where? Onto a hard drive or maybe even the cloud. But guess what the cloud is made up of? Hard drives. Not SSDs, not thumb drives, but hard drives. Hard drives are incredibly reliable devices. Optical drives like CD-ROMs or DVDs, they're still used. Blu-ray, I still use them. Whenever I buy something on Apple iTunes, any type of music, I then burn it to a CD or a DVD and then I put it in my vault, making sure I don't lose it in the future. And then also tape drives. You might think, what in the world tape drives? Well, as you can see here, this picture shows a tape drive that you can sit on top of your computer and each tape holds 30 terabytes of data. That's what I call a backup. That's what I call archiving your data in such a way where it will, it will stick around for a long time. That's what secondary storage is all about. And I mentioned earlier that the CPU takes inputs and creates outputs. Well, what is, a, what is an input into the CPU? Well, your keyboard. Every time you type on your keyboard. This camera that I'm using right here to record this video, that is an input device. Your mouse, as you move your mouse around, it's telling the CPU or the computer where on the screen the little mouse pointer should be displayed. Your joystick as your, or your game controller as you're 
playing games. It's inputting what buttons you're pressing, what or you know what movement of the joystick you're doing, and also disk drives, SSD, thumb drives. All of their, those secondary storage devices are also considered input devices into the computer, and some of these are also output devices. An output device sends data out of the computer to the user, to its storage device like a disk drive. So your display, your printer, all of those are, are output devices. There's millions of different types of output devices. And that is what the CPU has to manage, the inputs and the outputs. So let's talk more about programming languages. Now, I am going to create a video where I'm actually going to show a video of me opening up a computer and looking inside and messing around with all the components and identifying them. So I'm going to be doing that in the near future. But for right now, let's talk about what a programming language actually is. Since human beings don't really think of on and off switches, we think in base 10, not base 2. We need something more language-like, more English-like for us English speakers. And we need that to program a computer more easily. And programming languages were invented back in the 30s or was it the 50s to make it easier for human beings when I say 50s I mean 1950s to make it easier for human beings to program a collection of on and off switches which is the computer thousands of programming languages exist I wrote one when I was in one of my graduate programs everybody thinks their programming language is the best in the universe however only a few stick around and those are the more, most popular those are the ones that people use the most because they're the most useful. And they're really basically two types of programming languages and this is really important, an important concept. There's this idea of a compiled linked language. It, it's a language that needs to be prepared before the computer can actually execute its contents. And that's called a compiled link programming language. Then you've got an interpreted programming language which it doesn't have to be prepared but you need to have a special program called an interpreter installed on your computer that reads all of the code that the programmer wrote, converts it to machine code, the zeros and ones that the computer understands, and then executes each line one at a time. Each one of these, or both of these types of programming languages have their benefits and drawbacks. No one programming language is good for every programming need. For instance, I'm not going to use COBOL, for instance, which is an older business-oriented language. I'm not going to use COBOL to program a robot. That doesn't make any sense. What am I going to use to program a robot? I'm going to use assembler language or C to do that. Uh, what would I use Fortran for? Fortran is called formula translation language. It's really good for scientists with mathematics. But it's not really good to program a robot. Again, every language has its pluses and minuses, and it also has its audience of why you would use it. So let's go more over what a compiled language is. A compiled language, the steps that the user has to take is that, or the programmer has to take, is that you, you, you create a file called the source code file. Inside of that file are all of the language statements, all the statements that you're telling the computer to do one at a time sequentially from top to bottom. And you write that code in such a way that it's organized, it's correct, you then have to compile that program. It, that source file is then sent to a program called a compiler, which converts it into an object file containing ones and zeros. That object file isn't yet ready to run. It must be linked to the operating system object files so it can then be run on that operating system. We've done this for forever. That's the way that it works on every compiled language that I've ever known. Benefits of a compiled language, they're normally much faster, they're optimized. What that means is that the compiler looks at your code, moves things around to make it more efficient. It really does a lot for you. And it's small. It, it, it isn't as large. And what I mean by that is that it takes up less memory and disk space, the actual executable program. It's also in a way protected because it's not easy to look and understand an object file or an executable program where if you look at source code, if you know the language, you understand what that program is doing. And if you as the programmer are trying to copyright one of your algorithms or something you've invented in the code, it's not going to be protected at all. Some of the drawbacks of a compiled language, it really cannot be shared between different computer architectures. 
For instance, if I wrote a program on an Apple Macintosh or a compiled program on an Apple Macintosh and tried to get it to run on, on a Windows computer, it just wouldn't work. Okay, so the same thing like if I, if I wrote a program on a Raspberry Pi or if I wrote a program on a Windows computer, it wouldn't run on a Raspberry Pi or an Apple Mac. So compiled languages need to be, the programs that you use on a, or that you write for a compiled language needs to be compiled for each operating system or each uh, CPU architecture. And normally it is more difficult to master because of these extra steps. Uh, that, that, that is not any way or, or reason for, to ignore compiled languages. It's not an insurmountable problem. You just have to learn how to, how to make it work. Some of the examples of a compiled language, C, C++, uh, C is probably one of the most popular still out there. It's used for small systems. It's used for operating systems. It's used for building device drivers, which interface the computer with a device like a printer or a scanner. C++ is an extension of C which allows greater uh, programming paradigms and it's used more for business-like applications. It, it, it's not as small as C because it carries with it a lot of code baggage, but it is very useful. COBOL, common-oriented business, or I, I don't remember if it's common business-oriented language, but I used to code in it. I've written tens of thousands of lines of code of COBOL. It was really meant to produce business programs. It's still out there. It's still very popular. It's still used in a lot of financial institutions. It's actually a very good programming language. However, it's been around for years and years and years. Fortran formula translation, it's used by a lot of mathematicians. It's used by a, a lot of scientists. It's very, very popular as well in those areas. Pascal, that's an older programming language that a lot of people don't use. I wrote a lot of code in the 80s using Pascal. Java, well, it's kind of a compiled language. What Java, what you do with Java is it's on, it is interpreted, but it's interpreted after you compile it, and it tokenizes it, so it makes the it makes the source code much much smaller. So you actually take a Java source file, you run it through the Java C compiler, and it creates a class file, which is a tokenized, smaller, reduced program. And there there's more out there. What's an interpreted language? Now that we've talked about compiled languages, what's an interpreted language? An interpreted language is where the programmer creates a file called a source code file, just like in a compiled language. However, the file is not prepared, compiled, or linked. Instead, it is sent to a program called an interpreter, and then the interpreter prepares each line of code, each statement, each time the program is run by the user, and converts it into, a, into machine code and has the CPU execute it via the interpreter. So it's actually much more complicated than that, but that's a pretty easy way of thinking about it. Uh, what are some of the benefits of an interpreted language? I couldn't really come up with a whole bunch of them, but these are two big ones. It is very easy to share your interpreted program with different computer architectures. All you have to do is have an interpreter written for that architecture. So you have, let's use uh, Python for an example. There's a Python interpreter on Mac, there's a Python interpreter on Windows, there's a Python interpreter on Linux, there's a Python interpreter on Raspberry Pis, interpreted, interpreter. All those interpreters operate the same way, so then you take your Python program and you run on any one of those architectures. So that is a huge benefit of interpreted languages. And normally it is easier to, to master. Basic used to be an interpreted language, and it was one of the most popular back in the in the 80s, 90s, and even early 2000s. Python right now is the most popular because it's easy to learn. We use it in, in, in elementary school to teach computing and coding. Some of the drawbacks of interpreted languages really limit what it can what it can be used for. It is slower. It's normally not optimized. And the, and the source code files and the executable files, which there really aren't any because it's not prepared, are much larger. Some examples, basic, visual basic, Python today is probably the most popular, JavaScript, PHP. PHP is used to allow you to create dynamically produced web pages. Um, any Amazon.com, Amazon probably uses PHP. I don't know that for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, Perl, Rust, there's just so many uh, interpreted languages out there, but these are some of the most popular ones.
So what's the lowdown of all of this discussion about a computers and programming? Using a programming language, the programmer writes multiple statements that tell the computer CPU to do something. That's what a program is. It's multiple statements to tell the CPU to do something. You do these things top down, sequential. You can write, can write functions that you call, much like mathematical functions, but they're more algorithmic functions. These statements are then brought together into something I already mentioned, something often called an algorithm, a set of statements that get a certain job done. And the algorithm as a whole accomplishes a specific task or set of tasks to solve a specific problem. And that's what a program is all about. One of the things the programmer needs to do is they need to look at the problem that needs to be solved and decide upon the language to be used. Is an interpreter correct? Should I use Python? Should I use C++? Should I use assembler? I didn't mention assembler language because it really isn't compiled. It's assembled. So that's an animal on its own. And I actually have an entire channel playlist on assembler language. I welcome you to take a look at it. So once they decide on the language to be used, they have to do the overall design of the program or programs, plural, to be written. They have to figure out how will the user interact with the program. Will it be a command line interface? Will it be a GUI, graphical user interface? And then the data the program uses and produces. What kind of data is going to go into the program? What's going to happen to the data? Like you're going to design a game much differently than you're going to design a banking application. And that's really what it means to be a programmer, is to come up with all that. Now, I didn't even mention writing the code. Okay, if we go back, all of this stuff and more has to be decided upon before the actual program is written. You just don't start writing code. I mean, if you're a hobbyist, okay. But if you're a real professional programmer, you have to go through all of these pre-steps before you actually start writing the code. And that's what a programmer does. So with that all said, I hope that's a good introduction to what computer programming is all about. And I hope you visit me at some of my other playlists within the Bill Sky the Computer Guy channel. Until then, you have a great day.